Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, hi, everybody. Uh, really happy to have you today for uh, our seminar series. And we're really fortunate today to have one of our longtime uh, collaborators, Michael Wardlaw, here to join us today and to give the presentation. Uh, Mike is, um, again, a longtime collaborator with BeerWorks and BeerWorks Summer Institute. Uh, he is uh, held a number of senior leadership positions within the Navy. He's also a researcher and, uh, and lecturer at, at MIT. Uh, Mike uh, currently leads the Maritime Sensing Group at uh, the Office of Naval Research, which uh, is the primary science and technology development organization within the Navy. Um, so Mike leads uh, sensor development for a lot of undersea and surface vehicles, um, really driving a lot of innovation within the, the Navy realm. Uh, Mike has had a number of leadership uh, positions and also has had uh, numerous uh, awards and citations over the course of, of his career. Uh, a few of them, including the 2000 National Black Engineer of the Year uh, State Technical Con Contribution and Government Award. Um, he's part of the Direct Energy Professional Society, the Association of Old Crows, which is an organization for people who work in the uh, electronic warfare area, and uh, IEEE and AIAA. Uh, Mike uh, has his bachelor's from uh, North Carolina a and and his master's from NC State. Um, and I can say personally from having worked with Mike for a number of years, he is one of the more innovative and creative uh, minds that I had an opportunity to, to work with uh, sort of within the Navy community. So it's uh, with great pleasure, I have the opportunity to turn this over to Mike. Um, please, as you have questions, put them in the chat and uh, we will do uh, Q&A uh, mostly at the end of the talk. Um, so with that, Mike, I'm, I'm happy to turn this over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, I am tickled to death to be able to spend some time with you and tell you a little bit about uh, why I care so much about these underwater things <laughs> and the ocean in general. Uh, and just how crazy difficult it is to, to get anything done in the ocean. Um, it is the single largest uh, singular thing on our planet is the oceans. And uh, uh, it makes up about 70% of the surface area of the planet. And only a small fraction of that is actually available to us as freshwater. Um, that being something on the order of about 1% that's actually available to you and I and, and creatures that need the fresh water. Um, that's really a big deal um, since most of that water, 97% or so, is locked up in oceans. Uh, and we don't know very much about it. It's a very hostile environment. Uh, for humans to, to occupy. And so uh, the marine robotics that I'll be talking about is actually very key to uh, allowing us to really understand what's going on. And if you've been paying attention to the news lately, you'll get have some sensitivity to it because the temperatures have spiked in Europe. They're, they're really high to the point where it's lethal for people who are vulnerable. Um, and a lot of that, that thermal uh, mitigation, keeping the temperatures of the planet in a stable zone is controlled by the oceans. So um, oh, we'll get started with the slides. All right, with that as a background, um, you know, what are these underwater things, you know, that I'm talking about the, the platforms uh, next, please. They basically uh, come in three primary types, uh, varieties, if you like. There are profiling floats, um, there are underwater gliders, uh, and there are uh, unmanned underwater vehicles, UUVs, if you like. Um, each of those have different uh, aspects and sample the water column, move through the water column in different ways and can be used as platforms to take sensors uh, to places that we're interested in. Next, please. 
So I'll talk about the profiling floats briefly first. The profiling floats are basically uh, items that you can quickly and easily throw in the water, usually that's the case. Um, they, they drift. Um, most of the time they drift in the ocean, free drift with the current. Um, so they're an excellent way of understanding what the currents are actually doing in a given area. Uh, but they're, you know, basically moving with the current. You have no control over where they go, uh, you know, after you release them. Uh, or you have very little control over it. Uh, but what's nice about it is you can make them very inexpensive relatively, uh, and you can use them to sample the water column at various depths. So what you see here in the right-hand picture is um, the way these profiling floats work. They'll, when they're at the surface, they have access to GPS and communications that are in satellites or terrestrial in other ways. So RF communications, uh, optical communications, whatever is available, um, primarily they're talking to satellites. And on command or on um, schedule, they can dive to a pres prescribed depth and they can kind of hang out there uh, and drift with the current at depth, which is a very useful thing to understand because the currents on the surface are not necessarily the same as they are at depth. And while you're there, you can get salinity measurements and temperature measurements, conductivity measurements, um, and other kinds of me measurements of uh, material that's in the water, pollutants, whatever. Um, that's all very, very helpful for understanding uh, how, for example, the heat flux uh, from the sun is absorbed by the ocean. So if you want to understand hurricanes, for example, this is a really, really important piece of information that contributes to the weather forecasting. Um, then those floats can go down to deeper depths if they're programmed to do that. Uh, and lastly, ascend. Uh, and come back up to the surface uh, and report on what they have collected. So it's a very, very nice, simple platform for collecting that kind of data. But the thing to remember is you don't really have very much control over where they go. So what you see on the bottom left is the population of Argo, flight, uh, Argo floats. And there's a couple of takeaways here. Uh, Looking at this chart, it kind of looks like most everywhere, all the oceans are actually sampled equally. But this is actually representative of a, basically a one month sample. Um, over a course of 30 days, you might get a few samples in each of these areas, but they're very, very, very sparse samples. And uh, the US is responsible for most of those Argo floats out there. And of course, most of our interests are in areas that are around the US as well. So this is a great way of collecting the data, but the thing to remember, it is very sparse um, and that they're drifting with the current. Next. Right. Another kind of platform is an underwater glider. The gliders are similar to the profiling floats, except that uh, they, they also have buoyancy engines, but they have wings uh, so that they can generate lift while they're going up and down. Now, that's important because it provides some degrees of freedom in terms of control. So now while the vehicle is going up and down, it also has the ability to navigate underwater deliberately. So uh, it uses that buoyancy as a force that drives uh, the lift component in a direction that they want it. So they can fly down, fly up, and they do 
uh, what is the term of art is called yo-yos in the water where they're going up and down and up and down. And by going in this vertical up and down motion and with the wings, they're able to actually translate laterally in the ocean as well. But the thing to remember here is that they can't go left to right, let's say, without going up and down. So that's an important limitation on these vehicles. Um, it's not necessarily a bad limitation, but it is a constraint uh, in how you can use them to sample a particular area of the ocean effectively. The other thing is that they tend to be very, very slow. Um, so if you can get a knot or two of forward velocity out of these vehicles, you're doing really good. Now, the issue there is that a lot of times the current in the ocean might exceed the velocity that the platform can actually attain. So it can have some difficult, difficulty crossing currents that are strong. Currents like the, the um, uh, you know, any, the Crucio current in Japan, or uh, the currents that come up the east coast of the US. Um, those can be really challenging, if not impossible, in some cases for uh, a vehicle that can't generate forward velocity uh, uh, in any other way other than uh, going up and down. Um, and so that brings us to the next uh, chart, the next type of vehicle. And that's the UUVs. And these are the ones that you're probably most familiar with. Uh, the things that you see, they, they look like little mini submarines. And um, they have a propulsor on the back. That's the, the key, a propeller, if you like. Um, you know, all of these vehicles run on batteries. Uh, I'd say 99% of them run on traditional batteries. Uh, so, uh, in this case, uh, because a UUV has a propeller, you have, again, more control. So, the least controllable vehicle is a profiling float. The next uh, more controllable is a glider. And the UUVs are the most uh, controllable in terms of the degrees of freedom that you can use the vehicle for. Um, now, um, the UUVs are optimized to go laterally through the water column. So um, they're not generally optimized so much for going up and down, but they're really great for going left, right, uh, north, east, south, and west in the water. Uh, so if you have a particular depth in the water column that you're interested in, this is a really great vehicle uh, to put your sensors on so that you can, uh, as you see in the bottom left drawing, uh, essentially mow the lawn, uh, collecting data with the sensors on board that platform. So if, you, if you're looking for something in the column or you're looking for something on the bottom, you're doing surveys or something like that, this is a really good vehicle for those types of operations. Uh, the other thing they're good for is getting from point A to point B because they're going laterally through the water. And lastly, because they have propellers, um, if you need the speed, this is the way you can get it. You can go just increase the speed of the prop and you can force your way through most currents. Um, and so you tend not to get stuck in places that you don't want to be stuck. Next. All right, so what are the challenges with these things? And I call them affectionately thingies, um, but uh, all of these platforms uh, have essentially the same kinds of fundamental limitations and challenges. Those being the environment that they have to operate in, the logistical support that's required to use them, uh, the energy, communications, autonomy that's required, and navigation. 
And I'll, I'll dig into that just briefly here. Next, please. All right, the environment. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys know this, but the ocean is really possible to humans. <laughs> We were not, uh, we did not evolve to, to hang out in the ocean for very long. And there is a myriad of different ways to, to not actually survive the encounter. Um, it's also hostile to, you know, most electronics and uh, is hostile to materials, is hostile to communications. Uh, in other words, it's freaking hostile to everything. almost every way that you can imagine. And um, it's just something to really, really keep in mind um, when you're operating in this, in this environment that everything about it is alien to being human. We're, we're, we're very heavily biased to living on land and being on the ocean, near the ocean, uh, in the ocean is, is a very, very alien environment for our species. And it's just something to, to be aware of. It also is quite fun because of that. Next, please. Logistics. Uh, it's really hard, again. Um, it's hard to, to do things safely, as you see here on the right. This is uh, an underwater glider that they're trying to launch from a surface platform. There's a myriad of things that can go wrong when you're trying to put things in. And it's even more interesting when you're trying to take them out. Uh, launching and recovering vehicles is very expensive because generally it takes people and it takes large platforms. It takes good weather. Um, it takes a long time. Uh, did I say it's freaking hard? <laughs> it is really hard. Uh, again, hard things are fun, okay? Not to scare you off. This just, there's a lot of amazing things and there's a lot of opportunities when things tend to be difficult for most people that become kind of fun to figure out how to do them anyway. Next, please. Energy, <clears throat> um, there is never, ever, 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 ever enough energy. Um, did I say never enough energy? <laughs> uh, it's expensive to buy, it's expensive to maintain, it's expensive to transport, takes up way too much volume. And if you're talking about batteries, uh, batteries, for all intents and purposes, the proper way to think about them is that they're a slowly exploding bomb. And especially if you put them in close and in, in very dense packaging, they can be very dangerous. And so, but you need more of it um, in order to operate effectively in the water. At least that's the way we do it now. Um, I love this particular topic because it's so rich with opportunity for innovation. And uh, talking to young people in particular about this particular area is always fun because unlike an old guy like myself, you all are not burdened by all of the biases that I've collected and the rest of the people who are my age have collected. You can think about this stuff in a new way and create something that's amazing in this space. There's a lot of opportunity. Uh, this chart on the right just gives you an understanding from the standpoint of battery technology, um, the specific energy uh, and the energy densities that you have available for various materials. There's a lot of room here for some significant 
innovation and there's plenty of it going on and I'm expecting to see a lot more in the future. Um, I've, I've worked in this area pretty hard for the last 10 years and it, it's getting, it's getting to be fun. It's getting to be a lot more fun. Next, please. Communications. Um, did I say it's hard to operate in the ocean? <laughs> uh, communications is challenging as well. Uh, there's a reason why whales and marine mammals use acoustics underwater. It works. Um, however, um, again, as human beings, we tend to talk a lot and we need to, com we communicate a lot and, uh, you just can't do that effectively with acoustics sometimes because you just don't have the bandwidth. Uh, it, it, you know, acoustic signals interfere with each other. So there are some real challenges. RF systems, uh, the things that we're familiar with terrestrially and on the surface of the planet, generally speaking, do not work in the ocean. Um, the higher the frequency, the higher the loss. And so it doesn't tend to go very far. Optics, uh, I'm an optics person myself, so I'm very biased to trying to use optics. And it's great if the water is clear. Um, but in all cases, um, they tend to have fairly short range performance. So you can get megabits and even gigabits of performance uh, from point A to point B or from platform A to platform B, but it's sh over relatively short distances compared to acoustics. Acoustics is low bandwidth, not a lot of data, but longer range. Um, then there's magnetics and magnetic induction type systems, which is using the magnetic field or B field. Uh, again, it will work. It's not a self-supporting wave. Uh, so it's low, low bandwidths and relatively short ranges. And it's also it tends to be environmentally uh, sensitive as well. So communications is challenging, but um, there's a tremendous amount of research going on in this area, and it's all extremely interesting. Um, and I highly encourage uh, that you pay attention to that. Next, please. Autonomy. Um, autonomy, you know, when you don't have the energy, you can't communicate, uh, you have limits on your maneuvering capability. Uh, there's so many constraints that you're operating in, in, in this space. Uh, autonomy becomes really important because, um, for example, if you can't be in constant communication, then you can't actively control a vehicle. Uh, and if you can control a vehicle, it's going to have latency issues or limitations on range. So what you want to do and what we do a lot is we create these vehicles to be as smart and as autonomous as we possibly can. Uh, it's similar in some ways to what NASA has to do with the space vehicles uh, for different reasons, but it has a very similar impact. The latency in communicating with, let's say, Mars uh, I believe it's you know, a 20 minute delay or something like that. I forget what it is, but it's a significant enough delay that um, trying to control a vehicle on the surface is untenable. If you had to tell it, okay, take a step and then wait 20 minutes and then take another step. I forget exactly how long the delay is, but it's long enough that it makes it a little crazy. The same kind of thing happens in the ocean if you're if you don't have a level of autonomy that allows the vehicle to operate independent of the communications. So um, there's several different frameworks that people use to kind of manage the understanding of how much 
independent human independence is required and mission complexity and environmental complexity and playing with that to make it something that the vehicle can decide the things that the vehicle needs to do tactically in real time and then we can give it a mission objective that covers everything that we're interested in and strategically for the vehicle to do. Next, please. Last thing, but certainly not the least important is navigation. Um, since uh, you, RF energy does not propagate well under the water, the very first thing that you discover is GPS doesn't work underwater. It doesn't even work when it gets wet, but it certainly doesn't work underwater. Uh, so we have become very, very dependent on things like GPS. Uh, again, we have a bias living on the top of the, uh, the planet. Uh, you have to come up with other kinds of mechanisms to navigate effectively in the water. So the most fundamental of those is, you know, dead reckoning, you know, you know, being able to count um, screws or flaps or however uh, you want to count the propulsion uh, using a compass, uh, Doppler velocity logs, internal uh, measurement units, uh, and pressure sensors. Those are the things that are enumerated there on the left. Um, you can use uh, geophysical uh, references, both that are optical, acoustic, and magnetic. Um, there are all kinds of hardware sensors that you can bring to bear uh, in the forms of beacons. You can create short baselines or long baselines. You can use sonar, you can image uh, and use that and kind of take a more imaging approach to, to navigation. Uh, at the end of the day, all of this stuff needs to be incorporated into an autonomous system um, so that the data that's relevant for navigation is available to the platform. Because it's not gonna make a whole lot of sense for you to collect data and not know where you are. That doesn't work very well. So sometimes you need to know where you are, the vehicle needs to know where it is in real time. But at, at the very minimum, you need to be able to back out where, where the vehicle was when the data was collected. The vehicle might not need to know where it is, but you, when you're processing the data, you're gonna definitely need to understand where you were. Those are opportunities for managing the cost and complexity of how the navigation needs to occur. How much latency can you actually tolerate? And I think that's where I'm going to stop and take some questions. Um, I'd be it's very great, curious to, to learn what you might have. It might get you hit uh, over 20 questions. So uh, we'll get through as many as we uh, as many as we can as part of it. I'll uh, <laughs> call on a student and have them unmute and ask the okay. question. So uh, Luca, Luca Zerga, do you want to ask your question? You were first up. Yeah, sure. So I was just wondering, so how is the data from these AUVs analyzed and like how are possible like errors and like um, accounted for? Um, how is the data from the AUVs analyzed? Um, well, the first part is recovering the data from the vehicles in the first place. Um, generally speaking, for the gliders and the UUVs, uh, in order to get the detailed data, uh, you have to recover the vehicles. That's generally the state of practice at the moment. Um, the communications at the surface is usually limited to bits, or, or not bits, but snippets of data. So you can get a pretty good understanding that there's something useful there but you wind up having to recover the, the data because you, you might have terabytes of data that you've collected on a vehicle. Now, what that data is, if a CTE, uh, uh, 
uh, salinity, temperature, conductivity uh, data, uh, then you know maybe you'll have several hundred megabytes worth of data and you'll want to get all of the navigation data, all of the CTD data, any of the other data that you've collected and feed that into a model. Typically what happens is that data is fed into some sort of a model that is used to forecast or hindcast uh, things like weather. If you're looking for an object in the ocean, let's say you were using a sonar, um, then you can just imagine you, you, you're collecting a lot of data and you're using it to form an image. Um, it, it really depends. I'm sorry I can't answer the question in more detail, but I could, you know, it would take hours to, because each case is a little different. The bottom line is, is a, when there's a lot of data, it takes a lot of time. Thank you. Hopefully that helps. Yep. Yeah, Mike, there are a number of questions having to do with uh, endurance and energy storage, which I think you touched on as well. Um, Charles Benjamin, did you want to uh, unmute and ask what you'd asked earlier? Hi there. Um, I was wondering, how does the depth at which um, you run your UV mission um, affect the longevity of the mission? Ah, good question. Um, well, let me answer it this way. When the Malaysian airliner went down, it went down in really deep water. I know the guys that were looking for it. And one of the things that they were really frustrated by was the fact that they spent half of their energy going down and half of it coming up, which didn't leave a whole lot to go looking around. <laughs> so the deeper the operations, in, ma in many cases, the deeper the operation, the less uh, lateral flexibility you have with the UUV because you have to keep some energy in reserve just to get back to the surface. So um, it's not always that way. But often that's, that's the connection between depth and energy for UUV. The other one is speed. You know, speed, <laughs> speed kills, it kills batteries uh, because drag goes up dramatically um, with speed. So um, what you wanna do is you want to uh, only use only go as fast as you need to go uh, most of the time <laughs> uh, to keep the drag to a minimum. Sorry, uh, just to follow up. Um, so you're talking about how um, it took a lot of energy to go down and go up. Um, can you, is there anything like, like hybrid, like propulsion um, technology? Cause I know you're talking about um, how for like the gliders, or I think it was the gliders, um, the buoyancy helped them come up. Um, so yeah, could you touch on hybrid propulsion? Funny you should mention that. Um, the, the MIT class that I collaborate on teaching, uh, we just uh, are in our third generation of a hybrid vehicle. I mean, people have built hybrid vehicles before. Uh, the one that we're building is quite unique in that regard, especially from an energy perspective. Um, because of a couple of tricks that we've discovered, uh, we've been able to, at least uh, from the calculations we've done, because we haven't tested it all, but from the calculations, it looks like we will have been able to extend the endurance of the platform from 30 hours to 30 days. Um, which is a big deal. Um, it's almost impossibly a big deal, but uh, it takes advantage of some cool stuff that we did a while back. Uh, but the hybrid, I, I am a fan personally of hybrid vehicles for the reasons that I think you picked up on. Uh, if you can use the buoyancy engine uh, to go up and down and then use the propulsor to go laterally through the water column. That just seems like a really good thing to do. As long as you can manage 
you know, to reduce the drag that the prop will normally create when it's not in use. So cool. thank you so much. Yep. Switching <clears throat> to a question that's a little more navigation autonomy focused. Uh, Venkata, did you want to unmute and ask your question? Yeah. So uh, my question is, how do these devices circumvent and like deal with things like water pollution, fish, like animals, debris? Um, so how do the devices like interact with that and circumvent that? Let me see if I understand your question. How do the platforms uh, interact with um, like pollution products? Uh, restate it just again. I'm, I'm not sure I got your question. Yeah, so how do like the robots that are like being sent into the water, like how are they, um, I guess, programmed to like, um, I don't know, see if there's like, I don't know, a school of fish coming or um, how does it like interact with other things in the ocean? Okay, okay, I, I think I know where you're going. All right, um, well, that's, that's kind of the, the trick. Um, you know, in, in my work, I focus on developing mostly the sensors that go on these platforms. So let's say I'm looking for uh, an oil spill. Um, let's take the Deep Horizon oil spill, for example. Um, one of the real challenges that occurred with that event was the only the only assets that were available to to really understand the scope of that problem were satellite assets, um, they, and they were trying to use that to figure out how much oil was spilled and where was it going. What wasn't available to them was what was going on under the surface because they were looking from the satellite, and it. And they didn't have the right kinds of sensors on the platforms that they deployed to be able to see, well, where was the oil under the surface actually moving to? Um, had they had the sensors and the platforms to do that, they would have been able to much, they would have been able to estimate much better how much oil was actually being released from that well. So um, one of the things that, that I looked at was uh, how, what, how could you sample the ocean for the hydrocarbon concentrations in such a way that you could monitor the front of the, of the oil as, it, as it's moving through the water below the surface though. Because what was happening, the oil was heavy oil. So it was staying down near the bottom. And it wasn't until it got diluted enough that it came to the surface that it expressed itself in a way that the satellites could see it. So what you sometimes what you have to do is design the sensor for the problem. In fact, that's almost always what you wind up doing um, at some in, to some degree. Um, uh, there may be other ways to do it as well, where you're looking for tracers or anomalies. Um, and, and that's a very powerful technique too, because you, you look, if you have a historical reference of what the background looks like over a long period of time, then all you really have to do is look for changes in that background. And then you have a pretty good indication that there's something going on that you need to pay attention to. So that's another, uh, way of sensorizing these platforms. Uh, to get to what you're you're talking about, I think. Hey, uh, <clears throat> David uh, David Rye uh, had a question. I wonder if you could unmute and ask that, possibly. Are there? Uh, yeah, I had a few, but um, I one of them was basically I know a to B like deployment in general is really expensive. It's like fifty k a ship. You have to go back and forth. Um, has like have like remote charging stations off of like solar power or off like underwater cables been considered to like make shoreline deployment possible or like extend the mission or make it much less taxing on the, the human aspect of transporting out and in and like the labor force, all of that? 
I know um, like Imbari has like the Mars yep. platform, which has underwater cables and for like data power okay. transmission. So yeah, just curious. Yeah, well, I think, you know, that's absolutely key to, um, to this whole area of underwater vehicles. If I had it all my way, uh, that would be like the number one thing that we would be working on because um, the way I think about this stuff at this point is the problem in the, the biggest problem that we have with marine robotics is that the way we do it right now does not scale, right? Like you said, it costs way too much money to release these vehicles from the ship. You know, it could be $50,000 a day easily. I mean, most people can't do that, sustain it, sustain that kind of a consumption of, of resources. So being able to release it from the shore, uh, being able to repower the vehicle in stride or at certain points. I mean, when you go driving your car or when someone drives a car, they don't actually drive or tanker with them. And that's what we do now. <laughs> we kind of try to take all of the fuel with us that we ever think we're going to need for the entire mission. That's a little insane if you think about it, right? If we can put gas stations, quote unquote, in places that we need them near where we want the vehicles to work, it kind of makes a little bit of sense. And we have some history with being able to do things like that, at least terrestrial. So that opens up a whole lot of opportunity uh, to explore the space. And it solves a whole lot of other problems too. You don't, once you have the vehicle out in an area, why do you want it to come back to the surface? Well, you want it to come back to the surface so you can recover the data and you want it to recover, uh, come to the surface so it knows where it is. Well, if you put a gas station in the right place, guess what? The gas station can communicate uh, to the surface and the gas station, presumably, you know where you put it. So if you know where you put the gas station, the vehicle gets to the gas station, the vehicle knows where it is. So. You, you wind up solving a lot of problems by doing what you're suggesting, um, which is, uh, at the end of the day, what you're talking about doing is pulling, the, breaking the problem apart into pieces that you can actually solve. Instead of putting all the problems on the platform and making it embarrassingly expensive uh, to logistically support or to build, break the problem apart into pieces that you can manage and do it that way. Okay, all right, thank you. Hopefully that answers. Yeah. <clears throat> um, Mahir, uh, hoping I'm pronouncing the name right, Mahir Nagar Kadi, if you're there, I have an interesting question about comparison of autonomy in different domains, are you there? Yeah, um, so <laughs> my question was, uh, so we, we've been talking a lot about how um, uh, autonomous vehicles underwater are have a lot of challenges compared to like on land. Are there any fields where, or are there any ways in which it's easier underwater than on land? That's a good question. I don't, I don't think I've ever thought about it quite that way. Um, are there any things that are easier? Um, Perhaps, uh, I know this is, may sound a little strange, but um, from a certain point of view, uh, because you don't have, the underwater environment is so constraining that there actually is an opportunity for you to think more clearly and cleanly and precisely about what the autonomy needs to be, okay? Um, 
we do a lot of things terrestrially. I, I'll give you a good example. The self-driving cars, we jump immediately to uh, a design with self-driving cars where we put all of the smarts in the car. Uh, now, for most of us, the self-driving cars are not likely to be self-driving off the road. So why don't we put some of the sensors in the road? Why don't we put them alongside the road to support the self-driving cars so they don't have to do everything themselves? That induces a certain bias in the way we do things. The bias that we have created by having that kind of capability on the surface gets reflected in what we do on the water. That's where I'm going with this. And so there may be an opportunity to think more clearly about how autonomy should be unfolded underwater that actually is better. You know, it's more collaborative. You know, we take advantage of more uh, orthogonal and exogenous information in the underwater space that we probably would just blow by uh, terrestrially, because we can use brute force of, uh, approaches above water, but we don't have the energy and we don't have the communications to do that underwater. So we have to be smarter about it. I just cool. made that up, okay? So there, there was a question too, yeah. or a comment or two in chat too, Mike, about the relative speed. Constraints are always good. Yeah. There was a question too in chat as well about the relative speed of underwater vehicles versus air vehicles or ground vehicles, and that potentially being one thing that would maybe make undersea easier from a control standpoint or something. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that was good. I uh, just I, I yeah. one last question for you, Mike. Um, I want to know if you had any thoughts about where you see undersea exploration going in the Arctic, right? It's obviously a big area, and uh, you know, with the polar ice caps melting, there's a lot of interest from a, you know, global warming, climate change perspective to understand how, how that area is changing. Do you see like a, is that a big area of research right now, or are there, there are new things that are being thought of in that area? Yeah. Um, you know, one, one of the big areas that I see, uh, well, there are two. Uh, one is that the energy solutions that we have in the lower latitudes aren't likely to work <laughs> at the higher latitudes. Um, and so there's certainly an energy component to this that I'm, and you and you know a lot of people are really sensitive to. Uh, so that's the first one. The other is the navigation part. You know, we're, we're so accustomed to operating, you know, in the sweet spot on the planet that when we go to these extreme environments and the poles are extreme, <clears throat> not just in temperature, but in other ways, um, you kind of have to, you perhaps want to rethink some of that stuff. And, and uh, you know, spending some time with the local folks that are more accustomed to operating in those regions is probably a pretty good idea. That makes sense, that's great. Um, Lisa, do you want to take over and we can do the, the t-shirt presentation potentially? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So I would like to invite Aisha, um, Udeshi and Logan Wright, um, up and I am going to, um, and both of these are students in our autonomous underwater vehicle course that ONR is sponsoring as well. Okay, Aisha, you want, you want to go first? Okay, uh, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to speak with us. And I really learned a lot, especially as someone who is in the underwater autonomous vehicle course. And I learned a lot about the constraints of underwater vehicles and the different types of vehicles. And yeah, so thank you so much. And here is the BeaverWorks t-shirt. Uh, hopefully you will receive it soon. 
Yeah, and again, thank you so much for taking the time to do this and for your support of the class. I really learned a lot as well about the different, all the challenges that underwater vehicles face and I really enjoyed your presentation. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed sharing just a little bit of uh, the weirdness of water. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Mike. Yeah, thank you so much, Mike. The presentation was great. Obviously, uh, lots and lots of uh, conversation in the chat. We'll uh, we'll take a picture of the chat and send it to you so you can see all the all the comments and questions that the students had throughout. But this is fantastic. So really hey. perfect. Thank you, thank you very much for uh, hey, calling hey, in from hey. Portugal. Yeah, Mike, do you want to see like where you are? Share that with the students. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, one one of the side benefits of of doing all this kind of crazy work with vehicles is that I'm at the moment in the Azores, uh, which is, I don't know, like, like halfway in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Portugal, uh, between Portugal and the US um, uh, on the Fial Island in the Azores, uh, teaching a marine robotics course uh, and it is absolutely gorgeous here. <laughs> um, the weather is great. The beaches are great. Um, the students are great. It's a fun way to make a living. <laughs>